Welcome friends, welcome back to the kitchen. Uh, you'll see a stack of old cookbooks there on the edge of the counter. We're not doing an old cookbook show today. Let me explain what's happening. Um, first thing, I'm gonna put some pork fat, actually this is bacon fat, in this uh, Dutch oven. We'll get that sort of melting. A Couple weeks ago, hanging out on YouTube, as you do, uh, and in my feed was a video from Milk Street. And the show they were doing on Milk Street was called uh, South American Classics or something like that. And they were making a dish uh, that they had encountered in Colombia called Posta Negra. And essentially it is a uh, pot roast. We'll just call it a pot roast. And it looked really good. Fantastic, in fact. So I, you know, as I'm watching the video, I open another tab and I start Googling Posta Negra and I'm looking at the ingredient lists from multiple different recipes, and I realized um, that it was really familiar. The reason I think I was drawn to it is it sounded really familiar. Tweaked in the back of my brain, there's something scratching. So I pulled out a bunch of my old cookbooks from the mid 1800s to sort of uh, just before World War I. Okay, the oil is hot, so I'm gonna put in some diced onion and we'll get that, uh, we'll get that cooking. A little bit brown, but mostly we just want to get it translucent. Anyway, so I pull out some of these cookbooks. And what I found in pretty much all of these cookbooks, and a stack more inside, is that in the um, 1850s to early, maybe, maybe 1905, in the beef section, um, multiple recipes that all use the same spicing as Posta Negra. They use cloves, allspice berries, nutmeg, mace, cinnamon. Um, they add a little bit of sugar. They talk about rubbing the meat the night before some of them with the spice mix, leaving it overnight and cooking it the next day. It's always a braise um, and the braising liquid is up to you. So this is the Canadian cookbook, uh, the Dominion cookbook from 1899. This is Miss Bliss practical cookbook from 1850. And this is Picayune's Creole cookbook uh, from 1901, and this one is from uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. And so multiple recipes in each of these books for essentially the same thing. Um, and there was overlap between the recipes in some left out garlic and some added garlic. Some left out tomato, but some had tomato. Some used wine, some used water, some used chicken stock. And I realized that this is a recipe that's just gone out of favor. Um, in North America. Something new has come along and, and supplanted this, whereas in Colombia, it's taken a life of its own, gone in a different direction and become something. And so it's become something that is fairly common there. Now, the onions are translucent, just getting a little bit of color. I'm gonna put in two garlic cloves and I'm not gonna crush them or chop them up, or anything like that. Put those in. Next in, I have whole peppercorns. These are whole allspice berries. And yes, allspice is a berry. It's not a spice mix. A lot of people are mistaken and think that it's a, it's a mix of a whole bunch of different kinds of spices. It's all spices in a bottle. It's not, it's a single thing. Next in is whole clove. I have one blade of mace and mace is the wrapper that's around the outside of a nutmeg. Um, this goes around the outside and it's, it has some of the flavors of nutmeg, but it's got a different set of flavors. And I have, uh, I have a series of videos about all of these spices um, elsewhere on the channel. I'll try to link to them. So in goes the mace. And then next I'll grate in some nutmeg. I have dried mustard powder and a piece of cinnamon bark. Next in is some sugar, and I'm just gonna put in a little piece of this dark sugar. Um, most of these cookbooks say to use the darkest sugar that's available to you. Um, and so this is a really dark molasses filled, um, some people would call it a raw sugar. Um, goes by a whole bunch of different names depending on the culture that it's from. Next in is tomato paste. So a few tablespoons of tomato paste. I often forget the salt until it's too late. So I'm gonna put in some salt now and I will re-salt in a little while. 
give it a taste. Always be tasting. Always be tasting. Next in is some of our homemade Worcester sauce or um, Worcester sauce substitute. This I really like. It brings a really, really, really nice flavor. So it's much thicker than Worcester sauce, um, but the flavor is really close. So I'm going to put in a couple spoonfuls of that. That'll bring out some sweetness um, and some really earthy tones to the whole thing. So at this point, I'm just going to stir it all together. We are building a lot of flavors in the bottom of this pot. A lot of really nice warming spices, a little bit of sweet from the sugar and some acid from the tomato. I'm going to add in now some red wine. Now none of the recipes from the 1800s were very specific about what type of liquid. Some of them just said liquid. Some of them did say wine. Some of them said cider, beer, ale. Uh, chicken stock, some of them were just water. Put it in water. Um, I think water was the most common ingredient for the braising liquid. So I've put in some red wine. I'm also going to put in some chicken stock. And if you need to, you can put in water, you can put in beef stock, uh, you can put in vegetable stock. There's so many other liquids that you could put in. Really, it comes down to what your taste is. And on Milk Street, they were talking about how Posta Negra people put in Coca-Cola, which in the late 1800s could be a thing, um, and other types of pop, other types of soda. So, you know, Dr. Pepper would work probably too. Now that sauce is looking pretty good. We're going to put the beef in. So I have a fairly inexpensive cut of pot roast. There are so many cuts of inexpensive sort of tough meat that you could use in this. So use whichever one you can find at the supermarket this week. And I'm gonna put a lid on that. And I've got the oven preheated to 300 degrees. So just like any pot roast, I'm gonna stick it in here and it could go four, five hours. Just a long, slow cook. Now, while I was looking through these old cookbooks, trying to put together a recipe for the roast, in this old cookbook um, called the Galt Cookbook, and my copy was uh, is a first edition published in 1892, I came across a recipe for baked onions, and I thought that'll go really well with the roast. So we're going to do that one. There's not enough of a recipe here for it to be its own video. So um, I have a pot of water, and to that I'm going to salt it. I've washed the onions, washed any dirt off. I'm going to pop them in the pot. And it says to boil them for an hour um, and change the water twice in the time that it's boiling for that hour. So we'll get this on to boil and, uh, and see what happens. Now we take the onions out and drain them on a cloth. So get them out, drain them on a cloth. Take a piece of parchment paper and I've, I've Crumpled the parchment paper up just to make it a little more pliable. It says to put in a piece of butter and then wrap up the onion. And once they're wrapped up, they go into the oven for an hour, uh, which is just about as much time as I need to finish the roast. So. In they go. So once the roast is done, I've got it here resting with some tin foil, and I'm going to take the sauce and strain out the solids. And then I'm going to pour the liquid back into the same pot and bring this up to a boil. And once this comes up to a boil, I'm going to thicken it with some Bermanier which is just 50-50 butter and flour. You soften the butter a little bit and you mix in flour. And it gives you a nice, smooth, velvety sauce. And you just whisk in a little bit at a time. And I've done this before on the show and the comment stream was just unbelievable with people complaining that you would taste raw flour. You don't taste raw flour. 
This is something that's been used for hundreds of years in French cooking, and you do not taste raw flour at all. There's no, you have to boil it for 20 minutes to take away the raw flour taste. Pretty much as soon as it's thick, you can take it to the table. Hey, hey Glenn. Hey, friends. So, uh, get a couple of forks. Okay. We're having a pot roast of some sort. What's in the little baggie? Little bags? Um, little... Little onions, Ooh, little, little onions, little roasted onions. So let me get the, let me get the stack of cookbooks. Um, we need a stack of cookbooks for this one. Stack of cookbooks. Okay. So I, I was watching a video from Milk Street. Okay. And they were doing a pot roast from Colombia that had lots of interesting things in it, and I thought, you know, that sounds familiar. So I went back to these cookbooks, and you found a similar one. I found dozens of it, it, similar recipes. It does kind of reiterate that we have, uh, to a certain extent, been very global for a long time. Food has been very global for a long time. And it's also changed because the recipes with this type of spicing have not completely disappeared, but all but disappeared from, from cookbooks. So pull one of those out and put it up here, and I will cut some of this beef off and we'll give it a, we'll give it a shot. Hot. There we go. Oh, look at that. Onion. It's got it's the great. skin on it. You just pop it out. It still has the skin on it. So it's boiled and then put into the paper with some butter. So you slice it open and pop it out or as I do it with two forks? I would say, I would say you just kind of squeeze it out. There's no, there's no great way to do pot roast is there to cut a pot roast. It does not cut nicely. It more or less just falls apart like hot, hot. pulled beef. Hot, hot. Look at that. I think there's a better way to do that too. There probably is. <laughs> Probably the way would be to wait until it's a little bit cooler. Okay, so the beef first. <laughs> I mean, it just tastes like pot roast. Completely just tastes like a pot roast. Oh, no. What do you got after a little bit? I for, At first I just get the beef flavor and then I got I don't have a specific flavor, but I don't think it's as pot roasty as you claim. Okay, so I know what's in it. The secondary flavor that I get is the cinnamon and the allspice. See, I didn't want to say cinnamon because I always say, oh, there's cinnamon in it. And you're always like, no, there's no cinnamon in it. I apparently taste cinnamon everywhere. Okay, so here's some- I was gonna put onion with it, but I guess oh. I'll do both. Here's some gravy. Let's try it with the gravy. <laughs> Everything's always good with gravy. That's almost sweet. Mm -hmm. mm. That's pretty nice. That's very pleasant. There's sugar in there. Ah. <laughs> so I took, um, I took a, and I'm not going to say it correctly, so I'm not even going to bother. The only one I know how to say correctly is jaggery. I took some jaggery, um, but in, in it, it, it's just a dark, yeah. unfiltered very molasses. molasses. Yeah. And let me try that onion. Wow. I was worried that boiling an onion for an hour and then putting it in the oven, there'd be no flavor left. No, no, that was really good. That's it even amazing. came through on when I was yeah. eating it with the with the meat and gravy. So this is actually this is a bit of a winner. And I have to, I have to, and I'll let you in on a secret. Glenn was a little concerned. Earlier today, standing here in the studio, <laughs> I said, that smells horrible. I'm not gonna like that. Julie, this is gonna be a waste of time. We shouldn't even bother filming the tasting. But it's worked out. Mm -hmm. So give it a try if you're, you know, if you're looking for something interesting, something different that you haven't done before, you know, you're got the time to do it. Mm -hmm. Do it. So <laughs> if you want the Colombian recipe, search out Posta Negra, um, and you can do that, or you could play around with the recipe like I made. And I think rubbing the spices on this and leaving it in the fridge for 24 hours before you do the cook would, would, change, would change the flavor again, definitely. Thanks for stopping by. See you again soon.